Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Sean Gibbons. I'm the community manager for Magic, and I'm going to be interrogating these two. Hello. Hi. Who are you? Uh, I'm Mark Rosewater, uh, head designer for Magic the Gathering, and I was on the design team for Born of the Gods. I am Tom Lapelli. I am a, an advanced designer in the development group, and I was the lead developer for Born of the Gods. Ooh. Excellent. Behind us is Allison. Hi. Hi. She's, she's a community coordinator. She's going to be watching the Twitch chat and uh, taking some of your uh, questions. So leave questions in our chat. <laughs> Do it. I also have a bunch of questions that I gathered from around the community. So uh, Ask away. Yeah. I, I promised uh, Kathleen that I, had, I would ask her question first. Mm -hmm. Will cats be a viable tribe again soon? Uh, well, first of all, the, the, the set does have uh, some cat tokens, and right there's there's a little bit of cat tribal or cats at least here. Um, will there one day be a secret cat world where like, every creature has nine lives? <laughs> maybe, maybe. All, all that I will say is that I was the lead developer of these sets that both contained Rima's King of Arescos and Adaptive Automaton. So uh, I don't know. And I'm in Innistrad. Innistrad that had some cats. Yeah. That's some Dark zombie Ascension cats, even. Hey, Dark Ascension! Yeah, yeah. Dub, dub one, two, vanilla. Yeah. Cat. <laughs> My set, right here. We're a pro cat. Yes, we are. All right, uh, so uh, let's start off with some basic, uh, what, are, what are your thoughts on the set? Uh, what, what would you say your favorite cards in Born of the Gods are? Well, my favorite card is Eye Gouge. No, no, I, I just love the top-down home run flavor cards, like Rescue from the Underworld and Change of the Rocks from my favorites from Theros. So I, I just love Eye Gouge. That's my favorite. I think my favorite card is Brima's King of Oreskos. Mm -hmm. Cats? I, yeah. See? <laughs> Cats. I mean, I don't know. I enjoy Kiora a lot. Those two are, were both good. They were both the most challenging cards in the set, probably, to get right. And so uh, I, I spent a lot of time with them. I'm happy Kiora is finally out. Um, so what happened was we Kiora was in, I think, uh, Duels of Planeswalkers way back when, along mm -hmm. with Raul Derek. And we kept saying, oh, maybe one day if you like him, we'll get it out. And people kept bugging me for Kiora. And like, when's Kiora coming out? Like, finally, I'm so happy she's out because she's awesome. So she has great flavor text. Kiora, awesome. wait, she has flavor text? Or am I? She's got flavor oh, no. aspects, Sorry. but like not flavor a text, text on her. Right. She says things, she but says not, things. not on her own. On not other cards. Her own card did not have flavor text. Yeah. Sorry. Her card was funny for me because we very quickly got to the right text box, but it took us a really long time to find the numbers we settled on. So that was the hardest part there. Hmm. Yeah, the other thing that's fun is that she definitely has a deck. Like she has like a, an attitude and, you know, I, 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 we had a lot of fun in design of saying, she loves giant sea monsters. What can we do in the set to help make a giant sea monster deck? It was a fun one. Uh -huh. viable, so, if you like giant sea monsters, we don't just love cats. We also <laughs> love giant sea monsters. Maybe giant sea cats one day. Uh, I don't know. That, that's Cat a very fish. special world. Cat very fish. special. That's like world. a question for Doug Byer. Okay. Also, Kiora is Kiora is our picture on the stream right now. So she's like peeking over us right now. <laughs> you can kind of see it, like she's got the computer over there. We're a Brady Bunch. Somebody uh, in the Twitch chat uh, wants to know what your favorite gods are in the, in the Theros block. So, Born of the Gods uh, and In the Theros, Theros block? Uh, wow, that's a tough call. Uh, I like Xenagos best. Uh, I appreciate ambition as a characteristic in sentient entities, <laughs> and uh, let it not be said that Xenagos is anything but ambitious. I think I'm an Erebos fan. Um, I just, he's, he's my favorite character of the gods. That just I One of the things I enjoy a lot is that we have to call the wheel, we always approach things differently, and he's a different take on a black character. I, I think that everyone, you know, the little mustache twirling evil characters that sometimes we do, that it's nice to have a black character that's a little more, that, He's selfish, but in a different kind of way, and, you know, and, and he's a very black character, but it's not a traditional black character, and I enjoy that quite a bit. Yeah, okay. Uh, we were talking about, like, right before the stream started, we were talking about Xenagos. Oh, Xenagos, yes. Uh, sorry, Xenagos. Uh, what makes him, what makes him red-green to you? Well, so here's the big question I've been getting on a lot of my social media is, why isn't he red-black? Why is he red-green? Um, and so... It's two, two parts. Two, the answer is two parts. The first part is just because people are villains does not make them black. You know, black is about having selfish motives. Xenagos does not have selfish motives. 
In fact, Xenagos really believes that what he's doing is for the good of all of you know Theros. You know, and essentially what happens is he becomes a planeswalker and he learns some things he did not know, and it, it pissed him off really. Yeah. You know, and so like his motivations are very very red and green. You know, he's angry and he's acting out that's very red. And he actually is trying to get the world to where he thinks the natural state is supposed to be. He thinks the God has absorbed the natural state. So he's angry and trying to return to the natural state. That's red green. Yeah, and the other thing about it, I, I actually self-identify red green, which is something that probably most people would be surprised who don't know me all that well. It's like, yeah, I'm intelligent or whatever, I guess. But I just want to throw parties all the time and help people have fun. <laughs> Why do you shun so, blue? <laughs> I, I want to throw parties. That's why I came to work here. I, I throw card game parties all over the place indirectly, and it's awesome. So. And Poor of the Gods really is our party for you. So. It is. It, it totally is. I'm not kidding. Anyway. <laughs> Let's see. There was... Oh, there was like a question that was about Xenagos right on here. It was something like... Is it, is it the god? Um, yeah, yeah. Is the god um, planeswalker question? Yeah. Is it, it, with Xenagos' rise to to godhood, does he have the power of a god on just hit Theros? Okay. So or I, all I, asked all, I know some of this. I don't know all of it. Okay. So for starters, change, becoming a god does not make him not a planeswalker. He didn't change from a planeswalker to. I mean, card wise, he did. But in, in the story, he's both a planeswalker and a god now. Now, what happens if he leaves this plane to go somewhere else? Doug didn't have an answer to that one, so we don't know if he has <laughs> godlike powers elsewhere. But okay. in this world, he's not lost his planeswalker spark. Becoming a god does not take away the planeswalker spark. It, so he, I would certainly believe it if someone told me that it was the nature of Theros that whatever he had done in Theros makes him a god there. But if he were to go somewhere else, the new place he went may not have the same nature. Because it doesn't have like Nyx as part yeah, of yeah, Theros. Yeah, I, I believe yeah. that Theros has something that allows the gods to exist. And that you left them, that that wouldn't be there. So I don't right. feel comfortable saying any more than what we just so said. So qu quasi officially. Okay, look, it's unofficial. It's unofficial. So don't don't quote me, or you will. But um, <laughs> I'm saying I don't think he's a guy elsewhere. That's that's my official non-official statement. That's bold. Very bold. Um, what's the idea behind Chromanticore? What's the idea behind it? Yeah. Uh, How did you come up with it? Ryan Spain actually designed oh, that it. Was Ryan, Spain. Ryan Spain designed it. Yes. Okay. Um, so Ryan Spain used to be on. Um, uh, limited Resources, it's a, a very famous Magic uh, podcast, and we hired him here, and now he works on Magic Online. And uh, he was on the design team for uh, Born of the Gods, and that was one of his cards. The idea that Ken Nagel had for it, I, at least when I asked him, what in the world is this card doing in your design file, Ken? He <laughs> said, I want to take this chance to make a five-color bestow card. So here it is. And I said, what parts of this card are you attached to? And he said, Wuburg in the mana cost, Wuburg on the bestow, and five abilities that match the things. So in the end, the abilities that made it onto the card, many of them have been used by white, which is unfortunate. Mm -hmm. But that is also the only combination of five keywords that fit on a magic card. So we were kind of stuck. Which is interesting, by the way, because another big question that we get on Command Core is the people who want them to be legendary and the number one reason, I mean, there's a couple of reasons. One is only the gods are legendary enchantment creatures. That's the first reason. But the second reason is it doesn't fit. Like, literally, you cannot write the words right. legendary <laughs> creature enchantment, um, whatever, manticore on, on his card. So, And to, to be clear, I don't really enjoy it when standard has too many legendary permanents in it because yeah. then games can get decided by, oh, did I draw my second... Erebos instead of whatever if you were playing two in a competitive deck right now or whatever. That I don't find that to be fun and if half of my mythics are already going to be legendary for creative reasons, adding a sixth sounds pretty wrong to me. So also, uh, if there was room for more flavor text, they would talk about how the skies were blackened by the swarms of Chromantic uh, flying in the air, because, you know, there's lots of them. So. Okay. Yes, lots of them. Many. Alright, here's one from... Jay Whiskey, uh, I think I'm, this was a Reddit question. Uh, will we be seeing more Minotaurs to make Tribal viable in competitive standard? Uh, I mean, Minotaurs are de Minotaur Tribals are thing in the whole block during the next one. More Minotaurs. There's Minotaurs in Born of the Gods. Theros said Minotaurs. Yeah. Uh, Tom will have to speak uh, about uh, competitive play. Uh, 
I, I just made sure there were minotaurs. <laughs> I don't want to answer that definitively because that would be telling you things. About yeah, things. that's true. Uh, I mean, that's kind of a journey to well, end the next question, also, because like. Well, I mean, so I, on a larger answer, our goal lately is not to engineer exactly what standard will look like. Our goal is to create an environment where there's a large category of outcomes that we could be happy with. So do I know if there will be a Minotaur deck that is winning open series tournaments? No. And if I did know, then I think we would be making it way too easy for all of you out there. So, <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah. we, we, one thing we did do, and design did this very purposely, is Minotaur Tribal. Like every year, we do some tribal. Like every year, we do some tribal. And that this year, we're like, OK, Minotaur is the tribal that we kind of wanted to push. Um, we, the reason we push Minotaur Tribal, by the way, is people, uh, Didgeridoo is, is somehow uh, become this very popular card. And like one of the things we've learned is when cards that aren't that good become really popular, there's just something that other people like. Mm -hmm. And that people like Minotaurs. But like, we're in the Greek mythology world, and so it seemed like a perfect opportunity. So there are a lot of Minotaur Tribal cards. I mean, I'm not, I don't know whether or not it'll make it on that top tournament tier, but if you want to have fun with those Minotaurs, Look, there's Minotaurs to play. You, you can definitely have fun and play Minotaurs. Awesome. Uh, the Greeny T, let's see, the Multicolored God's Weapons. Uh, a lot of people are actually oh, uh, are are asking, yeah, where why are don't why don't the, the minor gods have weapons like that? Well, okay, well, I mean, there, there's the simple answer and the complex answer. Mm -hmm. The simple answer is, well, I'll go to the complex answer. You might want to hear the complex answer. Forget the simple answer. I'll take the simple answer. Okay, you the simple answer. <laughs> there's no room in the set. Okay, that's the simple answer. A small set is so small, <laughs> like, there's not room to do a ton of things. If I, if I have to use up a seventh of the rare slots in the set, on a thing that is super cycled out and has uh -huh. tons of abilities, it's just it takes up so much room. So I was really hoping that Ken was not going to give me them because I don't think I could have executed well on the set containing them. So I'm glad we did it the way we did. And, and we, now Mark Rosewater. And like, oh, we never had them, by the way. They were never intended. So one of the things that's important is part of doing magic sets is in the first set you want to set some stuff up, you want to follow with some expectations. But if you if everything's the same, if like here are the gods and here are the major gods and here's all the things we do, and the other sets just do the exact same thing, then mm -hmm. there's, there's not a lot of room to do new things. You know, we want to do new and fun, exciting things. We wanted to inspire and tribute and we wanted space to be able to do cool things and that we just can't fit it in. I mean, Tom's short answer is basically the long answer, which is we want to explore and have fun and that we wanted the gods and we made sure that there were the 15 gods, but there's just we want to be able to explore, and, and we just sort of do the same thing again and again. A, it gets boring, and B, it just means there's less space for more fun things. And to be clear, we love pattern matching just as much as you guys do, but sometimes we can only pattern match so much. And we do. We, we, pattern, we pattern match plenty. There is 15 gods, and they're one of each color combination in both monocolor and two-color. So. This, is, this ties right into that. Uh, do you guys try to make cycles... Um, until the end of development, or is it like a, a bonus if they do make it to print? I guess that's sort of a weird way of putting it, but like how, how, do, how do you think about cycles as part of a set, basically? Well, okay, so cycles are a tool. That they're a very important tool of, of design. Uh, and the reason the cycles are there, I mean, they, they do a bunch of purposes, but one of the most things is when you're trying to communicate something, like one of the things about magic that people don't realize until they think about it is, we don't control how, how you see things. That if player A and player B open a, a pack of Born of the Gods, mm -hmm. they're going to have a very different experience when they open it. So one of the things we try to do is to have some commonalities to increase the chance that you're seeing things we want you to see. And so one of the reasons we do cycles is it's just five times the opportunity to make sure that you're seeing things, that there, we want to create patterns, we want to create some sort of experience that you can understand. And so cycles do that really well. It also makes it easier to learn the cards. So one of the things that was an interesting piece of feedback that I got on the set from Aaron in the middle was that the inspired uncommon token making cards were all, they, they all had numbers that were much further apart from one another. And Aaron said to me, the cycles in the set are not as disjoint, they're not as close as maybe they could be. So I'm having a harder time remembering what all the cards do. Mm -hmm. So that caused me to tighten some things up Part of that tightening up was all of those token makers now cost 2C 
when you want to make a token because that way they all just you can remember what they do, which I think is an underrated ability that cycles give us. And, and another thing that cycles do, which is really important, is they let you show differences, which is important. That like when you have things that are same, now you get how does the green one do it, how does the white one do it. You know that you mm -hmm. can see how different things work, and that I think it's very important that like I mean, Tom is correct. We want to make sets so the audience can experience them, and and like a lot of what we do is setting things up to help you learn and help it make it easier to play and help yeah. you experience what we're trying to do. And that cycles are a valuable, valuable tool. I mean, if you go back in history, magic. It's not like we started doing cycles. Alpha had lots of cycles. All of the early sets had lots of cycles. It's not. It's not like some new happenstance. It's. It's. You know, I, I used to say to people like, if, if I was building a house, you know, it's like they're like a hammer. Like you kind of want it. They're very valuable. Cool. Let's see. Uh, Monstrosity was dropped in favor of tribute in Born of the Gods. Do you have to remove abilities in new sets uh, just to make room for yes. new ones? Yes. Yeah, so, we do. Here's what I would do at home, a little, a little at home. Let's take a shoebox, and then put some things in the shoebox. And then, try to put more things in the shoebox. At some point, you're like, I have to take things out of the shoebox to put more things in the shoebox. And that, one of the things was, like, we're going to do new things in, in sets, right? One of the things we try to do is, we'd like to have a little bit of new thing in the set, and we want to be able to evolve things and change things, and that, like Tom was saying earlier, like, there's only so much space in the set. And that if we wanted to do something cool that's new, something old, you know, we had to make some room for it. And mm -hmm. when you look at the other mechanics, the other mechanics were all doing something that were harder to take out. Um, structurally speaking, the other, the other mechanics all had kind of a job to do, where monstrosity was easier to extract. And we had a cool mechanic tribute that we liked that, like, it was a monster mechanic, so well, let's take the monster mechanic out and put, put this in place of the monster mechanic. Okay. The, the other thing that I want to add about that is that Monstrosity is doing an important job, yeah. limited, but it can do that job well enough with only two packs of it, and then we found another solution for it later. Yes. So, so I mean, the, the thing that's interesting about Tribute, by the way, is so we started this thing called advanced planning, where we start doing sets even earlier than we did before. Mm -hmm. um, and Tribute actually got designed before Born of the God design started. Like, the advanced planning team made Tribute, and it was just a really cool mechanic. Um, cause so do you want to talk Punisher mechanic? Oh, uh, a little bit. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm, se I'm segueing to other questions. That <laughs> yeah, right. I'm looking forward to this one. Okay, okay. So the question is. The so question I'm is. Gonna, uh, uh, so we're on this sheet from Reddit. Uh, okay, I, the tribute mechanic seems to be getting uh, a mix of varying comments. Uh, a lot of players consider the browbeat punishment mechanics to be worse than more straightforward effects. And uh, they're wondering if, if the perception has changed the way that uh, R&D looks at these kinds of mechanics. Okay. Well, let me start by changing your perception and audience. <laughs> um, the Punisher mechanic, of which Tribute is similar to, which mm -hmm. is I give my audience, I give my opponent two choices to choose from. Um, the Punisher mechanic is very popular. Now, there are people that don't like it, but there's a lot of players that really, really do like it. Mm -hmm. And so... Uh, a lot of times people are like, well, that's not something I like. Why do you do that? It's like, well, because there are other players that like different things, and it is very popular. Punish the reason we, we did tribute was we knew people liked the Punisher, the Punisher mechanic. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything to add to that? <laughs> <laughs> so from a development perspective, I, I'm part of the crowd that did not enjoy the majority of the Punisher cards the first time around. And yet I put it in my set. Why did I do that? The thing about it is Browbeat is the most generally popular, as far as I'm aware, of those cards. And in the decks where Browbeat is popular, I'm probably just throwing burn spells at your face. So when I say, would you like to take five damage, or do you want to give me three cards? Those are actually pretty close options, and they're both bad. And because they're close, you get more than you might have gotten out of the card otherwise. Mm -hmm. So secretly, it's kind of an extra value thing, in my, uh, my opinion. but. When I realized that, the, re the time that tribute cards are fun, or punisher cards, is when the difference between the choices is smaller. In the case of tribute, I get to make the difference between the two cases smaller, because there's this creature that both of the things are attached to. So if I say, do you want to destroy all creatures, or do you just want to take six, those are so far apart from one another that one of them will probably be worthless, so Breaking Point is not a particularly well-loved card as far as I'm aware, but 
when you look at a tribute card, the like the rare green um, guy that has tribute. You got our books. Name, I should know, but I don't know <laughs> card names yet because they change out from under us, and that's hard. Yeah, maybe we should explain that for a second. You yeah, guys work with totally different card names. Well, right. So when, when design has the fight, we've made up names. And so our names are yes. goofy Nessie names. And Wild I mean, Trap, this yeah. was an actual top-down set, so some of our names were, were pseudo absolute Greek mythology names. Right. But um, although in our case, usually they were like, like we would name it after the actual thing we were trying to be similar. Uh -huh. So like, if we wanted to be like Hercules, like it's Hercules, even though it'll never be called Hercules, it'll be called something else. But we'll give it the name of the Greek mythology name so the creative knows, oh, we're doing, this is the, the trope, we're, you know, this is the thing we're doing. Uh -huh. So let's actually look at Fanatic of Xenagos. That's the uncommon oh, yeah. green guy with Tribute. He doesn't have a lot of difference between the two modes on him. And he's actually my favorite Tribute card in the set. But either way, you're getting a deal on turn three with that guy. And I can give you more of a deal because there's choice. And sometimes it'll come back to bite you a little bit. But because their things are so close to one another, it's I get a more consistent thing. And then when you have to make that decision, it's more interesting because the decision's closer. If the decision is far apart, it's generally very easy because one of them is clearly worse. Mm -hmm. So that's why I am very happy with how the tribute cards worked out. Great. Uh, here's a sort of related question. What's the basic difference between uh, a creature uh, ability like flying or uh, land walk vers versus devotion? Like how, how are they weighed? Because every set will have flying creatures, not every set will have devotion. Well, I mean, okay, we have what we call evergreen mechanics, okay. which means flying, first strike, trample. Like, Every single set, you know, pretty much has this mechanic. Those mechanics that there are basic tools that we use all the time. And then every set and every block has you know new mechanics that are meant to be just for a short period of time, usually for the duration of the block. Okay. Um, and they are different animals. I mean, the the reason that flying and first strike are in every set is they serve a general purpose. You know, like uh, evasion has to exist so that you can get through, especially limited, that you can, the game will end, you know, that it, it's not just creature stall, so you need evasion, you need different things to make the game happen, you know, what people forget is that, like, a certain portion of magic is magic, that every time you play, there's just certain things that magic has to do, and then, you know, there's dressing that we change, the things that we change to make it different each time, but, like, part of the game is always the same, and then part of the game is different. And the evergreen mechanics are part of what makes it always the same, and the new mechanics for the black are what make it, makes it different. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, Demir colored cards, black, black, blue cards, seem to be very uh, heavily mill focused right now. Uh, is it going to stay like that? Is that on purpose? What are your thoughts? So I'll tell the story of Phoenix, I guess, and then I'll pass sure. it on to you. Okay. Yep. So Phoenix was tricky for us to do, partially because blue-black decks are not traditionally the kind of decks that make you want to throw a bunch of permanents on the table. So we felt like in a medium-late attempt to help that god be a little bit more exciting, that we wanted a card that helped you feel good about having permanence in your blue-black deck. We also realized that blue and black were where the inspired cards were mostly located. So Eric Lauer, brilliant problem solver that he is, was like, we should have a blue-black god that gives you an ability that lets you tap your creatures. And then from there, it, we had some trouble figuring out what it was supposed to do, but when we got to milling, it just it just felt right, and I think on an individual card level, it, it was probably right for the card, but... So, I mean, here's what's going on. I mean, I, through social media, I've gotten this message very loudly, which is, last year we had a guild leader, and we had a guild champion, and this year there was a god, this block, there was a god, and now there is... I mean, there was a planeswalker, and now there's a god, and that, oh, all these high-profile blue-black cards are milling. And the reality is, I know when we go back and like Tom examines each card in its vacuum and made a lot of sense why we did it, but look, it's a very valid note. I mean, one of the reasons we have this give and take with the audience is we want feedback. You know what? I agree. It, it is a mistake that so many high profile cards that are blue, black are mill themed. It, it's a note we are taking in. We know that some people like milling, but some do not, and that we should mix it up. I, I, 
we are listening to you guys. I mean, that that is a very valid, good point, and it's something we're taking to heart. I mean, be aware, we work two years ahead of time, so it's not like <laughs> things change immediately, but it is a very strong note, and we are taking it to heart. I do think that Ashiok for development was, was not viewed the same as the Demir cards that you were talking yeah. about, because Ashiok to us was much more about getting your opponent's creatures, so we thought of it as more kind of a control magic guy, but hmm. it's that's just how it occurred to us, because we're... We're spiky people who don't <laughs> so much read the cards as like play with them a lot, and then we forget what the text on the cards are and, sometimes. And, and I want to stress, when you guys communicate to us, I mean, so name, name your social medium of choice. I mean, we, we pay attention to all of it. We do not ignore what you guys say. We listen very much to what you say. Like, when, when people have an issue with something, either we try to explain it or we say, you know what? We own up that, hey, we're not perfect. We make mistakes and that. I think this is a, a strong note and something we will take to heart. Cool. Uh, we were talking about Tribune, and I totally forgot to, to bring up Nate Holt's okay. uh, question. Nate Holt is the, um, the, the, Walking the, Plains. the Walking the Plains, the narrator, the, the wizard on, on Walking the Plains. Are you required to offer 1-1 one, one counters on bended knee while paying Tribute? Uh, you are, actually, yes. That, that is, if you're technically playing correctly, you need to get down on one. I, I won't be mad if you don't. <laughs> Just say no. Do you have to yell out, <laughs> I volunteer as Tribute? Uh, that is voluntary. That is not a Okay, question. great. Uh, that's, uh, that is... You can choose to do that. I would be very careful about the context in which you make that statement. I, I would gladly volunteer as tribute, depending on okay. my choice. Uh, I have a question just for Tom. It seems like all the sets you develop include divination. Whether or not that's the case, <laughs> do you have a soft spot for that card? I do have a soft spot for that card, and I think the reason why it has shown up so often in my sets is that I really like spending a lot of complication and sort of complexity budget on the mechanics that my sets are about. So I can only put so, so many cards that take up a lot of mind space in a set before you start running out of remembering how all these things work. And I run into this playing a lot, I play a lot of role playing games outside of work and I find in a lot of role-playing games, the text is like on a gear character sheet, and it's in a book, and it's keeping all this stuff, track of all this stuff is, is difficult for some people, and often me, so I'm very sensitive to that on cards. So I like to make my interesting cards the ones that you are rewarded more for paying attention to because they're new and novel. Mm -hmm. So then I get to a point where it's like, oh geez, I need a card drawing spell. And then I realize I can make a card drawing spell that has three words on it. And I am very happy, and then I put the <laughs> in my set. In the case of Born of the Gods, it's kind of criminal to not have a card with a name as good as Divination in the block somewhere. Uh -huh. So I felt extra not bad about it here, because of course Divination is a thing that should happen in H3. It totally but, fits. Right. I, I will say that Tom claims he's red green, but his favorite card is Divination. No, so I'm, no. I, I'm reporting him to Gruul. <laughs> My favorite card is Negate. <laughs> okay. Actually, which, which is, is also <laughs> which is also. <laughs> From, from a development point of view, uh, my, my favorite card as a player is Grimlock and Mancer. Okay, so that, that's a tip. Which I put in one of my sets. Anyway. All right, uh, let's talk more about red. Uh, red is usually synonymous with haste, but the mm -hmm. newest ar uh, archetype card presents trample and denies uh, your opponent's trample, which is typically a green keyword. Okay, uh, well, I will explain. Um, so the way we do it is colors, every mechanic has uh, primary and sometimes it has a secondary. So primary means it's the main color that does it, and secondary means, oh, it does it, but not quite as much as the primary. Mm -hmm. So trample is primary in green, but it's secondary in red, meaning if you look at sets, red gets trample. Trample is something that red is allowed to do. And so when we make cycles, we could always do the, the most obvious one, like we could just take the primary of each color, but that gets kind of boring. Like should green always be trample? Should red always be haste? Mm -hmm. So we like to mix it up some. So uh, red has access to trample. It definitely can do trample. So hey, mix it up. Uh, there's actually a much simpler explanation. Uh, what all the, everything that Mark said is true, but I think the audience is often willing to give us more credit for deep meanings of things we do than is actually there. <laughs> In this case, we already made Hammer of Perforos and Theros. If you want to give all your creatures haste with a red card, you can. Yeah. So we thought we would give you something else. But that, that's another big thing that happens is one of the things we try to do is we look at what we've done in blocks around it 
uh, and sometimes within the same block or within the same set. And that we try to also just like not do the same thing. And so if some other car like granted haste, well, like, right. we did that. So right. we'll try to find different mixes. And I'm pretty sure if we had made the red archetype be haste, that someone would have asked a question for us. Right. Which is, <laughs> Why did you give me haste twice, wizards? And well, we didn't want that either. So we'll take the question you just asked. That's fine. <laughs> Here's one from the Twitch chat. Uh, okay. This is a flavor-based question. What's th what's the inspired mechanic based upon in Greek? Um, Man? I can tell where it started, but it changed. Mm -hmm. So um, early on, one of the things that happens is I work so far ahead, my, my team and I, that the creative team is busy like making the current world and not the next world because uh, I'm I'm always a couple a couple ahead, and so I sort of have to do some filler until we get there, and so. We knew we were doing Greek world. We knew, we knew some of the conflict between the gods and the, the people and this and that. And so um, originally it was meant to be these creatures dreaming into existence, these, these um, enchantment beings. And so the idea, the flavor originally was the tap that you were asleep and that, um, you know, that as you woke up, then you know, your, your dreams would come to life. Okay. And so <laughs> I, some of that's still there. I'm not quite sure. Like, it's, it's a lot less literal now than it once was, partially because if we drew a bunch of pictures of creatures that were asleep, that would be boring looking. <laughs> so we didn't want to do that. So the, the idea now is more that you have experiences in life, you have ideas that come to mind, and those ideas, for whatever reason in Theros, are becoming manifest through various ways. Uh, whatever you wish to make of the fact that the inspired cards that make creature tokens are making enchantments, I leave that up to you, but that, that wasn't an accident. So there is, by the way, a very good story about inspired. Do we have time to talk about inspired? Yeah. Um, so originally, we, we knew that we wanted them to like work when they were sleeping, be tapped. Mm -hmm. So the first version just had activated abilities they could only use when they were tapped. Um, but we found that people were abusing that because once you were tapped, you would use it multiple times. And we think, oh, we only want you to use it once. So, oh, okay, well, you can only use a tap, and part of using it untaps you. So, yeah, we, <laughs> we had a one playtest in Divine where I asked Ken to investigate the untap symbol, uh -huh. which was interesting, but it was like, this is close, but not it. And I said, what about when card name becomes untapped? Because... Well, one of the things that I've always found really interesting about the way that that mechanic has been received is that in design, there were tons of cards that were like, and you can untap your guy. And it's like, well, we have the untap step for this, so it's probably more important for us to get ways to tap your guys, because that's harder if you can't just attack, even though it's really nice that you can just attack. So. In, on, on some level, I wish I had made cards that people found more satisfying to somehow interact with those cards. But every time I tried to make an inspired enabler of some sort, if it was like a, and as an additional cost, you can untap a guy. It was like, well, why is that there? I'll just wait for my untap step. And if it's like, you can tap all your guys, then they, things get complicated and wordy. So we end up with like Banishing Knack and there's a white instant that lets you tap X guys and you scry one, which that card is nice for getting your stuff tapped secretly. And then like there's spring leaf drum, but mm -hmm. it's actually, I found it difficult to make satisfying magic cards that interact with that mechanic that also stand up as a magic card. So in the end, we have the cycle of auras that give your creatures tap abilities. And I'm very happy with how those turned out, but mm -hmm. there was a limit to how much you could put in the set before you were making cards that looked really weird out of context. And real quickly, the cycle of tap, things that graft tap, tap abilities onto your features, we were looking for new things to do with auras because one of the big themes of the block is that there's different auras. Mm -hmm. I mean, some are bristow, but some are normal auras. And that we were kind of trying to find neat things to do with auras, and we were then later trying to find enablers for the inspired mechanic, and like, ooh, you know. That was good. So anyway, I, I, I love it when two things come together. So. <laughs> Will there ever be enchantment artifact creatures? Uh, wait, hold on. I think I have an answer for you. There is one, right? It's a token. Uh, Isn't the oh golem? Yeah, yeah. There's a uh, golem, yeah. right? Um, hammer, hammer of Perforos. Yeah, Perforos makes a artifact token, right? Or the hammer makes an artifact token? Yeah. So. I also recommend using the red inspired rare whose name I can't find. I take back my question. 
Uh, Felhide Spirit Binder. Okay. To copy an artifact creature, and you can make your very own artifact in the future. <laughs> yeah, people have been for, about, for about a turn, but uh, people have been asking, "Are we going to make enchantment lands?" Uh, uh, and my answer there is once no. burned, <laughs> once burned, twice shy. No. So in the Mirrodin, I made some artifact lands, no. and I thought they, they'd be fun, and you could do neat things with them. They were fun, and then we banned them all. So my, uh, <laughs> my DCI rating went up like three hundred points <laughs> while I was playing with those. So. Anyway, uh, what cards did you have good. to bend the rules to make? What kind of bend the rules? Uh, I mean, I always bend rules. I don't know what. Yeah. Uh, 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 to answer that question, I wish we could show a picture of a German chromanticore <laughs> because that the font size on that has got to be tiny. <laughs> um, bend. Um, I mean, we always bend. The weird thing is, we always bend things. So, like, mm -hmm. I don't, bending things is normal magic. So, I, I don't know. Tromocratus has a pretty weird line of text on it that... Which one? Uh, Tromocratus. Oh, yeah, yeah. The, the one where if it attacks, it's no longer hexproof, right? Uh, yes, but the... I guess that's a slightly weird line. I, I got some strange feedback about the story for that the, that card's second ability that I just liked it, so... That's actually one of my favorite cards in yeah. the set, so... Um, enough people told me they liked it that I kept yes. it. Yeah. <laughs> Who doesn't like the Kraken? Uh -huh. Rima's King of Arescos had a weird line of text on it until close to the end when we figured out that it didn't work, and now it's not... It that was worse. less unworkable, which mm -hmm. is good, but... There was one... Uh, there was somebody uh, earlier in the chat, this is like right when we first started, so sorry for waiting so long to ask this question, but it's about perplexing Chimera. Yes, are you perplexed? Okay. Uh, it seems like uh, it's not as new player friendly as uh, some other cards. We are willing to make weird cards if we think they're fun. It, I, it, yeah. It's rare too, like it's rare. It is a rare. Yeah. I, the thing that sold me on this is something that we're doing now that we didn't used to do is we have drafts off-site with some of the strongest players that are in the building with a new set. I was not sure what to make of Perplexing Chimera. You might say that I was perplexed, <laughs> Derp. Uh, but then Ian Duke had Perplexing Chimera in a game at one of those offsites against me. And we got into a combat situation where Perplexing Chimera was blocking something, and then someone cast a giant growth. And we sat there and stared at each other and thought for about a minute and a half. And it was like, okay, that was actually super fun. And a lot of the multiplayer-oriented people also thought that the card was fun. So enough different categories were telling me that it was fun that it was like, hey, sure, great. So certainly I am all for it when I can put Divination as my card drawing spell if I just want a simple card. But I am, as I said, I am more than willing to spill complexity on a card if I think it's worth it. And Perplexing Chimera is, in my mind, clearly worth it. Yeah, be aware that it's not that we don't want complexity, because magic, for, first of all, magic's a complex game. Um, we do want to have complexity. The point is where we use it and how we use it. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of our recent things have been getting out of common, so that, you know, a new player, the majority of the cards they experience when they open a pack are common. We want to make sure most of the cards they see are something they can understand. And just for in for limited, it just makes limited easier to play. Yeah, mm -hmm. it, as, speaking as a player who has played in or Pro Tours, and I have a Grand Prix Top 8, like, I should be able to handle all this complexity, right? But, like, I have more fun when I can think about things that are fun to think about, and I don't have to spend as much time thinking about things that are less interesting. So we try to put the complication on the interesting, and then it's just better. So I just want to point out, I'm the guy who forced Huntmaster of the Fells through, <laughs> that card has more words on it than any other card I'm pretty sure that we've printed in the last three or four years. I put Divination in the same set as Huntmaster well, of, of the course. Fells, but <laughs> of course, but it's me. I, I protected Huntmaster of the Fells, and that card is not simple. So. And, and be aware that what we want to happen is that there's focal points for the complexity, meaning if everything's just a little bit complex, that's really hard. If one or two cards are complex, but you, you can focus on them, it's much easier to, to rock and follow. At least you know that card. Well, and, like, right, I, I know what my focus is. Like One of the things we found, like, if you look back to the like, time of Lorwyn, this is kind of where New World Order came from, mm -hmm. where there's like every card cared about multiple other cards, and like it just was mind-melting trying to understand the board state of what would happen. You know, people would walk into tricks that were on the board because just 
who could tell that this and this and this, you know, and that. I understand there's a small segment of players that just like load it on, you know, but most players, it just, it's not as fun if I have to use my mental energy just remembering things versus using it on strategy and using it on trying to make the best play. You know, and that, that's a big shift we've been in the last couple of years is let's make, let, let people use their brains to do the fun part and not do the monotonous part. Mm -hmm. So what it sounds like kind of you were saying is when you see a card that's, that looks complex, that you realize is a little bit more complex than average, you ask yourself, is this interesting or is it just complicated? Is this interesting, is it fun, or is it just complicated? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And if it's, if it's worth it, then I will go to the mat to protect it. It's, both Tromocratus and Perplexing Chimera had enemies, but I was the development lead and I got to save them. <laughs> so I saved them. Okay. I'm glad I did. Uh, let's see, there's a, there's a Twitch, uh, there's a chat question here. Uh, the gold token seems uh, complex for just one small set. Was it designed to be in another set, or what's the story behind gold? Uh, the story behind gold, in fact, started in Theros. We made a King Midas card. Uh, oddly in white, which in retrospect, why was it white? It should have been black, I don't know. Uh, it was made originally in white, and any creature that it fought turned to gold, I think was how it worked. Um, it and anyway, it, uh -huh. it was a weird card, and uh, we needed a kill spell, and I think uh, can it, well, someone on the design team came up with the idea of, oh, well what if the kill spell was just, I turn it to gold? That seems like a pretty good mythological, you know? We were trying to make as many references as, as to as many popular Greek, you know, myth mythological tales, and uh -huh. King Midas is pretty popular. Um, so, I mean, like, like I said, my only sadness of this card is we came up with this awesome idea of somehow getting um, Felicia Day to preview Guild, and it didn't happen, but uh, 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 I like the card, though. I think the card is pretty awesome. The card is fun. I think also maybe a lot of people don't realize that the King Midas fable is mm -hmm. Greek in origin. Oh, it's possible they don't know. Like, yeah. Yeah. Oh, here's another question again about Gil. I'm going to answer this while we're on Gil. Mm -hmm. Like, why is this a black card? And like, oh, I think you're confusing. This is not, like, blue does transformation, which is you are one creature, and I turn you into a different creature. Haha, -ha, I transform you. This is a kill spell in which, how do I kill you? I turn you into gold. And, and then, then I pick you up, <laughs> and I sit you over here on my table, and I cackle and cast some six drop on turn five. <laughs> right, so it is, it's a kill spell. Why is it black? Well, I'm killing somebody. That, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Okay. Uh, spring and, and keeping it. <laughs> with spring leaf drum uh, and strengths based around monocolor deck builds, how much inspiration did you draw from Shadowmourne? Um, this set has a lot of subtle influence of Shadowmoor, if you actually look close. I mean, like, Inspired is not that far away from the untapped symbol, and mm -hmm. there, there are definitely some things. I mean, Chroma was in, uh, in Shadowmoor Block, right. and obviously Devotion is here. Um, I, the Springly Drum came from the following, which was one, it's one of these other things where you're looking for two things, they meet in the middle. Uh, we, we wanted an artifact card to help you get your mana, and we wanted help Inspired, and like, da 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 da. Mm -hmm. And they fit together very nicely. So, okay. um, and it's one of the things that as soon as we found, we're like in, and then it never left. I mean, you know, awesome. Uh, there's a functional reprint of Banishing Deck called Retraction Helix that. Oh that yeah, was, yeah. That was also. I don't remember when that ended up in the file, but I know. I mean, look when when you do it, when you have things that are counting mana symbols, and we have yeah. something that's playing with tapped and untapped, like. We're going to end up in some of the same space. I personally think we executed a lot better on both of those things than Shadowmore did. So yeah. we've learned a lot since then. So we keep getting better. That's our goal. If you find that players really love gold, mm -hmm. do you think it might be a returning thing? Do, how, 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 how much did you guys like it? I, mean, I like uh, it. I like the card. The gold token? Yeah, just, just ha it's kind of unique. It's. Well. Uh, the thing about it is, like, it's this kind of thing that just sits on the table and it's not very interactive or whatever. Like, the, we, the way we ended up at Eldrazi spawn was we were playing mm -hmm. around with things that were sort of like gold, and instead it was like, it was just more fun if they were creatures that you could well, interact the, with. Or the actual answer, with. you remember the actual answer of why it changed? Oh, well... I, I thought it was more fun too. I know. I, I also thought it was more fun. <laughs> a lot of times we have problems, we solve them, and the solutions end up being more fun. But the reason we changed it was Scars of Mirrodin was coming right after it, 
And the original version, you got a token that you could use for mana, but then we had poison come in the very next set, and that also gave you a, a token. And we didn't want two different tokens. Like, I have two tokens. Well, this is my poison token, and this is my mana but, token. But the creatures okay. were still way more fun. Yes, so. and then we made the change to make it different from in fact, and then it ended up being better than it was before. I mean, I think the takeaway here is that we are willing to spend token slots on funny one-off gags when we think it's worth it, and here it was just clearly worth it. So mm -hmm. what that means to you, I would not invest too much meeting. <laughs> I, mean, I will say this, whenever the public likes something, we, we're aware of it, and I mean, we have to find a place that makes sense to use it. I mean, the mechanic, I, my, I have what I call my spider sense, right? I know I have to talk to development because maybe it's gonna cause problems. This is the kind of mechanic that in mass, I know I'd have to talk to development because Whenever you get mana, it, 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 you can cause all sorts of problems. Mm -hmm. So the reason I like the creatures more than the art, of, like having a token or whatever, is that if it's creatures, at least I can like play some card that interacts with it if I want to kill them. If if it's a like just a ethereal little gold token over here, I can't like pyroclasm your mana acceleration or whatever. So okay. yeah. anyway, I like it when things interact with other things. Mm -hmm. So I mean, like I said, uh, anything that's popular has a chance of returning. Let's see. Uh, it's funny. I've got a question here from chat, and I've got a question earlier from, I think, our Facebook group. Okay. Uh, and they're conflicting with each other, so I'm just okay. going to combine them. Fighting question! Chaos will happen. <laughs> uh, a lot of the cards in Born of the Gods seem like they're designed for uh, Commander. Is this correct? Is this what you were thinking? And the other question is, what choices did you make so Born of the Gods had an impact on Legacy and Modern? Woo, fight, fight, fight. So here's what I think is going on. There's become a shorthand when you look at a card and say, oh, I don't think this is a high level tournament constructed card. It must have been designed for Commander. And no, I mean, we do design for Commander. There are things we keep Commander in mind, but that's just one format of many, many formats. And so we're thinking about limited, we're thinking about casual construction, we're thinking about vintage and legacy and modern and block and standard. I mean, there's a lot of formats out there that are played and draft and, you know, sealed. And yeah. we're trying, like, here's the, the trouble, or the hard part of our job, is magic is kind of mini games. Like, you know, there's lots of different games that it is. Mm -hmm. And that we're trying to, every set is trying to give cards to everybody. And so we're just trying to make a lot of different things for a lot of different players. And that not everything, like the tournament, you know, the standard can only have so many cards. And so, so many cards are thought of for standard, but you know, limited can take some cards and other formats and casual formats. And like, we're just trying to make everybody happy, which is. Right. The other thing that I, I want to, I do want to address the, the modern legacy question. Mm -hmm. We have experimented with making cards for modern and for legacy, and that has not always gone well for modern and for legacy. Um, Certainly, I'm not pleased that mental misstep is a thing we went through. Yes. That was not fun. I played some unsanctioned tournament legacy at somewhat high levels around Seattle while well, that was a thing. I didn't enjoy that. And for, as a competitive Magic player, we work on standard a lot. We play so many out man hours of standard, it's kind of ridiculous. So we can trust that sta cards we make for standard are going to be pretty good. But if we try to make cards for a format that we don't have that much time to play test, mm -hmm. I can't guarantee that that will be fun. Uh, if you're asking me to make cards for those formats, I would, I would ask yourself, uh, are you happy that Flusterstorm was a thing? We didn't have the chance to test Flusterstorm against Storm decks because that's just not a thing that we have time to do compared to making standard better for people. Are you happy about True Name Nemesis? Are you happy about Death Rite Shaman? Mm -hmm. These are questions that I think you should answer for yourself because we're going to be less accurate if we try to make cards for those non-rotating formats. I find it more fun, personally, as a competitive player, which I was for many years, when the cards are vetted for standard and it just organically appears which ones end up showing up later because that way, the cards, they do what they were meant to do, and I just enjoy it more when things are more organic as opposed to seeing this thing and it's like, oh, this was engineered, okay. Occasionally we'll take reactive shots, like Abrupt Decay was definitely made because we thought that Counterbalance was making Legacy a little bit less fun than it could be, 
and we wanted to add some pressure that made it a little bit less free to play counterbalance top lock decks. But in terms of targeting proactive cards for non-rotating formats, that's dangerous is a thing that we've learned, and I'm not sure you want us to do that, actually. <laughs> So maybe we should talk a little bit about the the future future league, which is how you okay. do, the FFL. Which, uh, yeah, <laughs> which is how a lot of the testing gets done, which is like a simulated standard ish yep. yeah. environment. I know we kind of describe it every time we have a, a stream, but mm -hmm. for those who don't know, what's the future future league? Okay, uh, the future future league is the silly name that we have for our standard constructed playtesting, and occasionally we playtest block as well because that is a Pro Tour format and it also shows us the cards in a different light. Mm -hmm. Generally we play just a lot, we build a lot of decks, we play a lot of games, we discover things about cards, we change cards, blowing up all of the decks, and then we, we repeat the process. For a while it was just everybody in development and some other people would do this as part of a regularly scheduled time and it was part of their job to just do that. We have added an extra team that plays hyper-competitively to try to really grind the edges off the most refined versions of the format, and we've seen some great returns from doing that too, which has been awesome. But basically we're just doing the same things that you guys are out there with fewer people, which is much, much <laughs> fewer, <laughs> fewer people. We are building decks, we are playing games, we are seeing what's good, we have the extra step of we get to change the cards, which you don't, and <laughs> then we do it again. And that's how you get all the magic that you guys play at FNM every Friday night. I don't play a lot of FNM. <laughs> 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 sure uh, okay. Back in the day, I did, actually. Most people don't know I started as a developer, although in retrospect, I, I, I'm a designer. So. Yeah. Let's see. I'm actually missing some FFL playtest time right now, so I can talk to uh, a few other people. So thank you. Yeah. So we're making magic just <laughs> smidgen. <laughs> yeah. There are plenty of one, plenty of excellent players and developers playing right now. <laughs> It'll be we'll be just fine. So the set two years from now or whatever you guys are playing. We'll cover we'll cover. This owl will not it's impact the quality fine. of the set. It's great. It'll be good. Okay. We have good stuff coming. Okay. <laughs> uh, let's see. Oh, um, so pre-release is this weekend? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I'm super jazzed. We're we're actually having our our own pre-release uh, Thursday, Thursday yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, which I'm really Thursday looking forward to. Guess a day and a half. I don't know about you guys. Yeah. You're you're gonna go green or red? Yeah. You're gonna go black? Uh, well, oh, no, just because my favorite god is black. Yeah, I'm yeah. Play black. I'm probably picking blue. I like playing blue <laughs> most. It doesn't mean I'm blue. Like, <laughs> Aha. If, if I were truly blue. I would pick the color combination that I thought would give me the best chance to win. <laughs> and that's not what I'm doing. I'm picking blue because I think I'll have the most fun by mm. playing blue cards, which is a green thing to do, so now it's all confusing. Uh, I, I guess I have fun with Inspired, so uh, it leans toward black yeah, blue. Yeah, so. black. Um, that's probably where I yeah. naturally will go. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. I might pick black. I, I kind of I haven't tried Pain Seer yet, and he looks really cool. Oh, Pain Seer's good? Uh, Let's see. Uh, oh, somebody was asking about What's like the fly that untaps to try the card. Uh, Sphinx's disciple. Uh, that, that's that's my favorite card. Is that the blue black? Uh, it's just a flyer. That oh no no no! That's the blue. Card and, you know, it's good. Yeah. <laughs> I was I was very interested reading some initial limited overviews of the set where some higher level pros think very different things about the cards than some of the things that we thought. And okay. It'll be well. very interesting to see who's right. Uh -huh. At this point, we have played more limited than you guys have right now. Yes. That will and that ends midday Friday or whatever. Yeah, right. Saturday. <laughs> it, it probably ends like two weeks from now for <laughs> any given person who drafts compulsively. Yeah. Or maybe maybe a month. I don't know, but we'll see. It's, it'll be I have a conglomerate uh, hours. You know, sure. Because you guys all play like our entire combined playing the uh, like. You know, a couple minutes in, you guys have played more than we have because you have so many players. So. Yeah. Yeah. The man hours difference is staggering. I uh, I totally lost my question there because I'm a terrible host. But uh, what, uh, so pre-release, okay. uh, what 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 can what's the seated booster going to be uh, like this time? People I mean, are curious it's about. It's very it. similar to how it worked in Theros. That mm -hmm. you'll have a choice between five boxes, um, and you will have a seated booster. You will have is it three or two board of the gods? Uh, it's two board of the two gods. Two board of the gods. But the seated seed booster pack yeah. that might as well be a pack of board of the gods. And three packs of theros. 
Okay. Uh, people are wondering if there are going to be, uh, because the packs are one color, yes. are the gods going to be so poten yes, potentially just, just in? Just like in Pharaohs, where you had a chance to get a god in a box, you will have the opportunity to, I mean, you have a chance to get a yeah, god yeah. in a box at Borobia. Okay, a great. A god in a box. A god in a box. Not a box. <laughs> <laughs> and as a seated booster, do you know if it's going to have Theros and Born of the Gods? All Born of the Gods. Okay. Yeah. Cool. It's just like a third pack of Born of the Gods, but with a... A little more focus. With a less opaque wrapper and more focus. Okay. Let's see. We have like a heart. few Ooh, minutes right. left. What else? Come on. Uh, so what? Tell, we give a, you have a story. Is it born of the gods? Favorite like a development story? Tell us a story. A, story. <laughs> a lot of the stories in this set are boring. I think because I got better at making sets. Like you mean it's more interesting if you're not good at it. Terrible, <laughs> like, I mean stuff like paints here. It was like. We tried to make an inspired specter of some sort that would be interesting. I don't know that. I don't inspired specter. Yeah, we yeah. haven't made a specter in a while, and it turns out that when you make specters that are aimed close to tournament constructed power levels, we mm -hmm. just don't think it's that fun anymore. So then the specter moved to uncommon, picked up a thing that let me conceivably have the card be blue, and then I made paint seer because that sounds like a cool <laughs> card, and everyone was like. Yeah, that does sound like a cool card. And then, basically, the card as I typed it into Multiverse on a whim is what we printed, which doesn't happen all that often. And more, it means that I got lucky than that I'm a brilliant person. Although I like to think I'm a brilliant person. Anyway. <laughs> it um, doesn't it doesn't negate maybe that you're a brilliant person. Right. It's correlation, causation, whatever. Uh, uh, Asphyxiate is also funny to me because. I stole that card from Duel Masters and Kaiju Do, which is another game that we make. And <laughs> you I like doing that, by the way. Uh, it's, oh, <laughs> there are good cards over there that are worth stealing. Uh, I mean, the card in Duel Masters and Kaiju Do is called Death Smoke, and uh -huh. in the file it was called Death Smoke for a while, and then the concepting name was also Death Smoke, and you will note that there is smoke causing death on the final <laughs> card, but Death Smoke did not make it onto the final card. Okay. So. so also, a little history, so... Um, Duel Masters was the first one that did the double the double face card. Oh yeah, that, I was totally on the design team that did double face cards first right. in Duel Masters. Right, we were yeah. trying to figure out how to do transformation, how to do werewolves, and Tom's like, well, Duel Master does this, and I'm like, that seems great. Okay, God, I'll try it. She's kind of great me, but we'll try it. And they worked out It's awesome, all so. my fault. So <laughs> it's not really all my fault. Lots of other people had to click yes on that. <laughs> yes. All right. Uh, Born of the Gods is, uh, people are wondering when it's going to be in the Gatherer uh, later today. Later today. Yeah. Yeah. And pre-release is this weekend, so uh, make sure make sure you pre-register at your store for pre-release. Uh, we don't want anybody getting booted out because it's full. <laughs> uh, and yeah, any other, any other advice for pre-release weekend? Uh, any advice? Pick your favorite color. You'll have more fun that way. Yeah. Yeah. Just see I mean, red, red, green. I told you. <laughs> I mean, the thing that, that I have great joy playing with the whole Theros block is it's just dripping with flavor, and so I, I like. That's why, I, like, I literally will probably on tributes like I give you the tribute, and like you know, I, I, I like getting into it. So have fun, enjoy it. It's fun. Awesome. Yeah, the pre-releases for me. I don't know. There, are, we make plenty of magic tournaments where the point is to go and have a super competitive experience where you fight all of your best friends in a room. The pre-release doesn't have to be that. I enjoy that a ton. I love doing it, but I suggest putting that away for the weekend. Bring it back another week from then. All right. Well, have fun, everybody. Uh, Mark and Tom, thank you so much for joining us oh, and answering all these questions. And uh, hopefully we can do this for, for a journey. We can get more R&D members in here. and uh, we, we know people. I think we can make it happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Thanks everybody who has questions uh, on on Twitter. Follow us on on Wizards underscore Magic. Uh, thank you everybody on Reddit who asked questions, and obviously in the Twitch chat. Thank you everybody who joined us for the stream, and uh, we will see you next time. Have fun this Bye -bye. weekend.